Most of the people are already here, so we can start. Welcome to my second talk today. Um, who did see this video this morning about continuous deployment? Okay, thank you very much for coming back. <laughs> um, this is like a very good continuation of the talk. So if you haven't seen it and you're in here now, it's not prerequisite that you were in there before. Um, so this is about monitoring or measuring everything and logging everything in real time so that you know what's happening in your application. And I will talk about this in the next 45, 50 minutes. And it's very nice that it's, because it's a very good continuation of the things you want to talk about. It's very important for things you want to do it. Yeah, this is a time seat. So this talk will be about in two parts. First, I'll talk a lot about logging. Why is it important? Why maybe have caring about your logs, looking at your logs important, and how you can do that. And the second one will be monitoring or measuring everything, and also talk how you can do this, what tools are out there, and what benefits you can from it. Um, as always, with everything, there are totally many tools and processes and stuff out there where how we can do logging and monitoring. There are many roads to go about that. I will just present like for everything one tool that worked really well for us. Um, if you have other tools, I will feel free to mention them at the end or afterwards. We'll have plenty of room for questions. And if they work for you, it's also great. It's just the important thing is you have to care about monitoring, you have to care about logging. Um, for that, who is us, it works for me. Um, I'm working for a social network model research gate. It's for scientists. We have about 5 million users. And um, it's all about researchers sharing their stuff together, sharing their publications, and things with each other. Um, yeah, investors, table tennis, kid power, visitors, we are hiring. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. <laughs> um, slides, I already uploaded the slides from this morning on Speaker Deck, so you can look at them there. I'm also going to leave them on Joint In. So if you haven't known on Joint In, go on there. Joint is a great platform to rate the, all the talks we're seeing today, which makes it easier for the organizers of this conference to invite good speakers again or find out what, what talks were good and what talks were not good. And also, the speakers, it's great to see what did work, what didn't work. So, let's start with the first, logging. It's very important to have logs to see what goes wrong and why does it go wrong in the application. You should even see that something goes wrong. If you look at a traditional PHP application, there are actually like kind of a lot of logs already coming out. You have the error log, with all errors and exceptions in there automatically. You have the Nexus log from your web server, the way all the requests are in that are coming in and into your servers. You may have some debug logging from some um, frameworks that you're already using, like Doc Time Symphony has some logging in there. And also your databases usually have some logging, be it a slow ferry log that you can enable, which shows you all the database queries that were kind of slow in your application. If you want to look at this, very easy, just SSH into your server, or if you're a Windows user, use Putty. And then you are in most cases on some Unix, Linux environment, so you just can go to your folder where your logs are, tail over it or grab over it and see what's happening there. Very easy. Use your favorite Unix command. Um, let's look a bit closer at error logs because they are probably the most important ones for finding out if something is broken. Because in PHP, all errors and exceptions are there. Um, Usually, it's configured somewhere in the uh, web server where the error is lying. For Apache, for example, the default, I think it's while logs Apache error.log. Depending on your environment and your web server, it may be different. Automatically, by default, PHP logs all errors, warning, notices, depending on any settings, and all unhandled extensions in there automatically. So you don't have to do anything. You can have a look in there and see if something's broken and your users may have seen an error patch. You can also log manually in there, which has a function called error underscore log, where you can log any kind of message in there from your application code. There's a lot of nice. Of course, the PHP error handling is not like the best, nicest thing in the world. So you probably don't want to rely on that, and you also probably don't want to display error messages or something like stack traces to your users. 
So most web applications actually use some kind of custom exception handling where you can register an exception handler in PHP and then do something with it, lock the exceptions to files maybe, and display a very nice error page to users, which could look like this and just um, prints out a nice description, maybe some IDs, some codes. For what these are, I can I'll tell you later. And one important thing to note in here is also your running on the error page, you still should care about this small thing here, the error response code. Um, because if you don't do that, so you should, this page should be returned with a good error code, like 500, 503, or something, like that. anything that's fitting the error that happened. If you don't do that, otherwise, search engines, for example, going there, you'll see, oh, this probably, it's an HTTP 200, it's probably valid content for this page, and we'll index it. With the 503, they won't do it because they see it's an error. Same thing with caches. Like lots of providers, or especially on mobile, have caches somewhere that cache content somehow, or varnish, if you use varnish in your environment, they would cache then these error responses if an exception happened because the database was not available at that point of time. Which is really bad, so you should really care about the valid HTTP response for this. If you want to look them up, here we see our C. We can prevent that. Um, also, I, in here, you see this kind of error code I did. Why did I do this on this page? Because usually if a bug report comes in from a colleague that's maybe not in IT or a customer, you get a screenshot from this page. I got this error page, what was wrong? Please fix it. <laughs> okay. First of all, it's very, very good that we didn't show any stack traces to users with any kind of code. That's great. Um, it's also great that the user cared enough about our application to send us this bug report and send us this email and even send us a screenshot. Yay! Okay. So, with this error code, it's actually something where we may be able to look up the error because it makes sense if you already have your own exception handling and put in your own exception pages and everything to also lock additional info with every exception that happens and every error that happens. That means for I can log an additional error code that I just generate randomly to my exception in my error log, and if I receive this email with the screenshot, I can just with the screenshot I can just uh, grab for this error code and find out what the exception behind this page actually was and find out the stack trace in my notes and everything. But it's not only the error code that could help us, I could also add all kinds of additional information to the logs that could be help pinpoint what was happening. For example, uh, information about the request, like the URL that was called, um, maybe cookies that were set, special, help, special headers that were set, and so on. Or the amount of database queries were done, everything that helps me finding out what is happening here. Also, PHP, being PHP, doesn't only have exceptions, but only also notices, warnings, errors, scheduler errors, fatal errors, and I don't know, probably like 20 kinds of deprecated errors and 20 kinds of other things, strict warnings. Um, it would be nice to load them in a structured way as well. By default, PHP just puts it in the error log and then you get a notice, um, undefined index at function, line, function something, file something, line something, and no further information. That means in a lot of places you don't know why did the code what it did and how it co could this invalid value come into my code in there. What you can do is, in PHP, you can set a custom error handler, right? It's a bit like the exception handler, where you can say, okay, um, I handle all the errors myself and don't want to PHP, let PHP handle them, and then I just lock all the error information, like I get the error number, which is the notice or warning or anything, the message, the file, the line number, I get this. I can also create a new exception object because then I get actually a stack trace. Okay. I can add this to my to some object or some array in here and just lock this in my error as well. Maybe in here it's JSON. I could I put it in this JSON because it's very cool, short to write. I could also do a nice string if you wanted to. Um, important here when if I have my own error hand now, if I'm returning true, PHP does not do any further error handling anymore. That means if I would return false, PHP would still lock this in my error in the error additionally. Could be okay. If I return true, PHP says, okay, the error is handled, 
Um, I don't have one. This works very well for everything but fatal errors. Fatal errors in PHP means the P execution of the PHP script stops completely and I can't do anything anymore. And PHP is prone to actually throw a lot of fatal errors, unfortunately. Even for dumb stuff like uh, null pointers, where you try to execute a method on a null value, which in other languages like Java throws you a null pointer exception that you can handle very nicely, and PHP is a fatal error and the script finished. Which is not completely true because PHP will still execute shutdown handles. So what we can do to also catch this fatal errors and add additional information to the fatal errors is able to pinpoint greater, better what is happening. We can um, subscribe the shutdown handler, which calls this nice function error get last, and if there was a fatal error, I can also lock it and enrich it with custom information. The only thing that is not handled by that then is if it's an out of memory fatal error, because if PHP is out of memory, then it will just also not execute the shutdown handles. Maybe in PHP 8, 9, 10 or something like this will be fixed. I don't know, probably never. But so far, if we have a custom exception handler, a custom error handler, and we have a shutdown handler listing for fatal errors, we are actually kind of good and can enrich all, this information, all the errors and exceptions with a lot of information to make the error lock much more usable to us than it was before. Second important thing, access logs. Access logs also come for free with our web application. Usually that look like this. You get the IP of the client, some timestamp, the method, the URL that was called, um, maybe a user agent in here, um, the response calls, response time, referrer, and there are like lots of other fields that automatically gets populated by your web server. For example, in Apache, again, it's the same thing as in the next. You can for, uh, have your custom log format in here, and there are tons of things you can log into there as well. Also, with Apache, you have a PHP function called Apache Node, where out of your PHP application, you can also log additional information to your access log. This is also with response headers, like private response headers, possible with Nginx as well. So, what you could do is, saying, okay, I don't want to only have uh, my user agent and my URL and my response time in there in the X slot, but also maybe something like the session ID, which only like your application knows about, maybe the account ID of the user that is logged in, um, maybe some configuration details, maybe some A-B testing things, whatever it helps you also having additional information on the X slots. Like for some research that we probably have like 15 additional things we log to the access log all the time. Uh, to, for example, what was really great for us is we are also logging the continent the user was on and the country the user is in. So we are just getting this out of the IP address because you can usually localize every IP at least to country and continent level. And then this is really useful to see where is the traffic coming from, which browsers are used in which countries and much more. Next thing that can help you is debug logging. With that. I mean, any additional logging you can do in, within your application. For example, every time you have a cache, you log it somewhere. Every time you have a database query, you can log it somewhere. Of course, we should probably not do it for every cache. We have to be kind of. Um, it is, if you log everything, like every cache and every database query that could lead to your log files exploding in size, because we probably have a lot of caches and a lot of um, <coughs> database queries and so on. So be a bit careful about that. A good tool for logging, for example, there are lots of libraries out there. One I really like is Mono, because it has a very nice and object-oriented interface. So with Monolog, I can say, okay, I create a new logger that should log to a file. So I push a handler for this file to my logger, and then I can add warnings, errors, and everything in there. And there are a lot of handlers in already available out of the box with monolog. For example, as I said, a stream where I can log into file. I could log to a mail, so send a mail for something, which is also useful for when, for example, if you have a payment process and the payment process breaks, there's an exception or an error somewhere, and I really want to want me to notice this right away. So I use Modo and just send a mail with the error to someone, and then you can immediately see that and handle that. 
Um, I could also log to some databases from there or to nothing in case of tests. And one very nice thing is this fingers crossed handler. What that means, you can log a lot of stuff to the fingers crossed handler, for example, like database trays, cache sheets, and everything, um, but it will hold it in memory until a certain condition is met. For example, this condition could be an exception is wrong. And only then it will persist it somewhere else, for example, in your log file. That means for errors, you can push a lot of stuff in there, and then for errors, you dump it to a file. So when an error happened, then you are interested in also all the other kind of information. I have it then. For every other request, which is hopefully like 99.9% .9 of my requests or something, I won't log it because I'm not interested in it anymore. If I'm doing all that and having all this kind of information, it's usually a very good way idea to log in a structured way in order to make it easier for other scripts, other things to read these logs. Because if I am producing, I don't know how many gigabytes of logs every day, it's probably not something humans will read out of log file anymore. I'll come to this later. So logging in a structured way for machine readability and not in one big string which I have to pass to regular expressions is a good idea. A nice thing is JSON, because there's lots of tooling around it. Every, every program language, every library has some JSON support in there. Um, I have command line support for JSON as well. So in our experience, it proved to be very good idea to log in JSON format. So one line is one JSON message for every log. In Moonlog, that's very easy. You can just add a formatter to your handler, like a stream handler here, and say, OK, I want to format every message in JSON. So that's our PHP application, everything with which logging can do that. But there are usually other services, be it a database, be it some other microservices that we heard of today that I created that also produce logs. And in lots of applications, it looks like I have a view request coming in, I have my PHP application handling this request, and then I'm offloading lots of stuff to databases, other services. Uh, doing custom stuff like recommendation stuff that I don't want to do in PHP, like sending emails or so on. And every one of them is producing their own log files. It would be now very nice to be able to say, okay, um, to correlate all these logs together. Because if an error happened here, and I have a very nice log message in this service, um, probably also an uh, error page will be rendered out here, or something is not working here anymore, and also produce a log message, so I want to correlate all this together. The way to do that, this easily, is by using so-called correlation or tracing methods. That means, when the user request comes in, what I do uh, right on top, that could be in your PHP application, or that could be even in your web server, like with an NGS model, for example, or in your local answer, I create a unique tracing ID for this request. This could be just a random unique ID. And then I'm sending this unique tracing ID through an HTTP header to every service that's called in this request. And I'm including this tracing ID in every log file I'm writing. So what I can do then is if I have one error message and I want to see what else happened in this request, in all my microservice server architecture, I just grab through all my logs with, for this tracing ID and I find everything. This is really valid. So the header could just look like this trace ID and then the random value. Um, unfortunately, our application usually does not look like this, like having one web server, maybe like one, two, three, four services. It probably looks more like this. So I have lots of web servers, lots of services, uh, lot, and also these are running in parallel and are horizontally balanced. And if I want to grab for through all my logs for this tracing ID and find out what happened there, yeah, it looks probably more like this. So of course you can do lots of stuff with DSH to help you, so distributed SSH and everything, but it's not fun anymore. And also my screen is not big enough for all these windows. Um, so it's also, additionally, what happens then if you only have, can you look at the logs with SSH on your servers, that everyone who wants to look at it needs actually the right to access your servers. And it's usually a good idea to not have every developer and every employee of you that may want to look at logs being able to access your servers as well. So, 
What can we do instead? We can aggregate all the logs in a central place, like a central database somewhere that usually has full text search capability. So grab on steroids and where I can aggregate all my logs from all the different sources too. Regardless of what I'm doing there with the central log management, so this is called central log management. Regardless of what I'm doing there, you should always log to file. Because seriously, you should always log to file. <laughs> <laughs> because every central log management will fail at some point. And I will guarantee you it will fail when you need it the most. Usually it fails because you, get, you have some errors there, you have so many log messages that your central log management database server or something breaks down, you can't access anymore, but you really need to know what's happening. So you should have these files as always as backup. The most naive approach for central log management is to, from your application servers from PHP, directly log into a database. Like you have your web servers, and every time you're logging into a file and your error handler, or uh, exception handler, you also insert to an insert query for some database, be it like MySQL, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, or something. This has some disadvantages. As you can imagine, what happens is the database is down. Oops, I don't get anything in there anymore. Uh, my central log management is broken, and probably also my script takes longer because the database calls are timing out. And if I didn't configure it correctly, that timing out for like 30 seconds. Okay, not very nice. Um, what is, is my database is slower than normal or really slow? Okay, my request to my application source also get very slow, which is kind of bad. What is if my database is full or something? What happens then with my action application? So every time I'm doing something in my, like this here. It's, it's affecting the requests that my web source are handling, or my sources are handling. So doing it directly in, from here is kind of bad. So I should offload it some. Also, this works very well for all kind of logging where I can do something in my application log. But what about the logs that are automatically created, like access logs from web server, slow query logs from the database, where I just can't put in some PHP code and log to a database. I want to have them in some time as well. And I don't want to influence application performance. Either. Also, if I just use like MySQL to log my errors, so there I still don't have any fancy kind of front end where I can search through the logs. So are there better solutions? Yes, there are. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of open source source. So there are a lot of better solutions. One of them is a combination of open source source called block slash Alexis Elastic Search and Kibana, which enables us full text, full text search over all our log messages. It actually performs very well. Like we have two servers now for our central log management, and we handle, I think, 177 gigabytes of log messages every day. So it works kind of really well. Um, and it really handles structured messages good, so we can have different fields with different values and then search all of them. Remember, always look at the bar. <laughs> um, I'm speaking from experience actually. So a setup with log stash and elastic search and Kibana will look like that. You have your you have your application servers in here, they always log to file, and then you have on each server a log stash instance which does tail on these files and then send the messages that pass out of these files to some queue server. It could be RabbitMQ, for example. And then you have a small log slash listening on RabbitMQ, and then putting the messages into a message search. Why this RabbitMQ in between? Because we could say, okay, we have a log slash in here. Log slash, I'll explain what log slash is doing in detail after that. We have a log slash in there that could write directly to a message search. If you have 500 web servers, and then something bad happens, you're creating a lot of log messages, and probably Elasticsearch will not be fast enough to handle that and index it all, and this big load all the time, at then as well. So having a small queue in there, a variable queue, is kind of load balancing, and if you have peaks, then you don't lose any log messages, it doesn't get slower, it just takes a bit more time until Elasticsearch index all this as well. So, Having a kind of queue in there as a log balancer is usually a good idea. So, you see a lot of log stash here. What is this log stash thing? It has a very nice logo. And it's a small daemon tool that 
basically does three things. It get, gets messages from one input. You can then filter these messages somehow, and you can send these messages that you filter them to one output. And it has a very rich plug-in system for inputs, filters, and outputs that you can use, and is very flexible in that case. So in our setup here, um, for these workstations running here, the input would be okay. I'm getting messages from my file. Filtering them, I'm probably doing some analysis in there, like for example, if it's an access log, I'm parsing the access log, and output would be AMPP. So this is what a, conf what a configuration for a buffer log search would look like. I'm telling it here to tail on my arrows, um, and also I should probably tell it to tail my access logs in here. Then in this case, I'm saying okay, uh, here, here I'm tailing also over my access logs. And then I have some filters. For example, here um, I then have a, pet, a rock filter, which is basically a regular expression matching, where I have this pattern of my access log and say, OK, I want to pass it and get fields like uh, original IP and request and everything out there in my message. Um, there's lots of example logs, such as a very good documentation out there. and very active user base, and if you Google for any kind of problems, you usually find very good solutions in there. So it's really an amazing tool. And my output would be, okay, send to MQP. Same thing with our small log search here, which gets the message out of MQP and into Elasticsearch is even more simple. I, my input is RabbitMQ, for example, where I listen to a certain queue. Then I've I have also filters that I could do. For example, I could say, okay, uh, I do further matching or further aggregation and tagging. For example, if it's a time log exception, I want to tag it in the tag not series so I can filter on it more later on more easily. And I have an output Elasticsearch, and it will then put it into Elasticsearch. Last thing, all of the puzzle of three open source tool is Kibana. Kibana is just a very nice JavaScript front end on top of Elasticsearch, where I can do full text search and have nice graphs and maps and bars and everything, which where I can see what exactly really is happening. I can create lots of very fancy dashboards. So, if you have any questions, do we have any questions about logging so far? Yes, over there. Question about um, authorization when the applications send a lot of the, let's say, the queuing hmm? mechanism? Okay, the question was about authorization between our application send this to the queuing system. Usually, you don't have any authorization in there, and all these services like um, my RedPoint queue and my Elasticsearch are only reachable from my private network. Like, so they are not. What most, most companies are doing like this, they are not public, publicly visible from the outside. They have to be into the private network. If you are at home and you want to look at it, you uh, have to connect through your VPN and then you can access this. This is like usually the thing we do. Of course, um, you could do some HTTP basing out on there, but usually you just hide it behind your network. Yes? Uh, what if you have some issues? Uh, Connection network issues between your servers and, for example, the Rabbit server. Okay, what if you have connection issues? You should solve them, and then you are very lucky we have logs. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But all these logs disappear or just stay on the servers? Um, so the question was what with the logs do they disappear or something? Yes, of course, first they disappear because. If there are connection issues, log search will not follow them. The nice thing is, you have a file, you have log files, you, so you should replay it, or replay it if you wanted to. Is it manual or that, uh, Replaying it would be a manual thing, yes. Um, usually, these are log files, and usually, I don't care about the log files that are older than like a few days anymore. Now. So, what we do, if we have these issues, we just throw them away and say, okay. We have the files, if we want to look at into it later on, we just go to the files, but it's most of the time we're just interested in, in, interested in what is happening now. Which is different for the next part of the talk, monitoring and measuring everything. 
And this is not for finding, mostly not for finding out if I have errors, but for finding out what is actually happening in my application and how is it behaving. And there are two kinds of things that are important with monitoring measure. First, you have technical metrics, which is how fast is my application, for example, how many database queries I'm doing, how many requests I'm getting into my application. So performance is a very good thing, scalability there. But there are also business metrics that are as important. Because with business metrics, it, um, they define, for example, how many signups do I have, how many users are logging in, how many uh, revenue I'm generating is my page, how is the conversion rate on some promotional things I'm doing. Um, also, and also these business, so I really should leverage them, and most, a lot of companies are, do them. The nice thing about that is that these business metrics and or KPIs, key performance indicators, and they are called, are also a good indicator of my application is really behaving very well, or not. It's a very good way to, in, to find out, for example, if I have logical bugs in my application. There are, again, very many tools for monitoring and measuring and getting nice graphs out of that. The one we are using is Graphite. Um, it basically works like that. You have your web servers, and for every metric you want to measure, like you say you want to increment the counter, or you want to set, send a timer somewhere, you're doing an UDP request to Graphite saying, hey, listen. This has some downsides, because if you have like 500 measuring points per request, and this is something that you very quickly can reach, uh, and all these web servers send them all the time to Graphite, which means you have 10, 50 web servers up by the 500 requests by probably like 50 requests per second, you actually send a lot of UDP requests to Graphite, which it won't be able to handle anymore. So Pete from Etsy has spoken and said, um, okay, there is a group. We're going to solve this with a small demon called Stats D. So, the way it works is you send it all this measurements, all this counts, all this time. It's not directly to Graphite, which is kind of slow with indexing, but to a demon, Stats D, which is very thin, doesn't consume a lot of memory, it's very fast, and it just receives them, does nothing with it, but only batches all the stuff going in there, and then every 10 seconds sends one request combined out to Graphite with all the metrics that should be increased. Because you have a limited amount of metrics, maybe 500, so the maximum thing it could send there is 500 values. If you do on one metric 50 increments, it will say, okay, increment this value by 50 in one, one metric, one thing. And also, if that does not work anymore, does that doesn't scale anymore, and this setup is not good enough anymore, you can add more sets to it. For example, have one sets the locally on a web server. This is the setup we are using. So here, with every metric, you're just connecting locally over localhost, which is very fast, with a UDP request, which is very safe because it's not going on the network, to a local set C on every web server. These sets these are um, aggregating everything and then sending every 10 seconds aggregated messages to grab. And if that does not scale anymore, you can change set C. Set C is very useful. Also, set C is an awesome tool that by that graphite is also an optional thing. So if you say, okay, I don't want to do graphite, I want to do really or uh, any kind of other monitoring service where I put the data in as a database and get nice graphs out of it, you can exchange it very easily. What kind of metrics does it support? Um, Countops, that's it, just incrementing something right. Every same time something happens, I'm incrementing metric. Timers, how long did something take? And medical stuff I can add to it. So, I think there's not a problem you can't answer with graphite if you have the metrics in there. And you can correlate different metrics and graphs with each other. It's a really powerful tool. If you don't want to set this up all yourself, as Boris said, that there are host platforms there, there are other solutions, one is Libra, for example. If you have all this data somewhere, it makes sense to make nice dashboards in your office there, so the important things are already visible everywhere. This is also a good motivational tool. And then, you have the problem that you have all these graphs and there are 500,000, 10,000 metrics somewhere. Somebody has to look at that. You have the important stuff on monitors, but what about the not important stuff? You still want to know if something fails or behaves weird. There comes in something called anomaly detection. Uh, I will show the slide like earlier this morning. Anomaly detection means you have a small service that 
looks at all the graphs that are in there and tries to notice if something is misbehaving. For example, here in this graph, in here is everything is normal, there is some fluctuation in there, that's okay, but then you have a spike in there. And then the anomaly detection notices the spike and will send you an alert, saying, hey, you want, may want to look at it, this behaves off. The anomaly detection, if it's good, is also intelligent enough to notice like daily spikes, for example. If you have a spike daily at 10 p.m. because you have some import running or something, in one graph, it will notice that they're not alert anymore because it's like the same thing every day. Um, this is a screenshot from a tool called Skyline, which also was built by Etsy and works very well with Graphite, but there are other solutions out there. Um, one thing that is from a, so this was like the general thing, how we can measure all that. For most applications, what's very important is actually the response time and the speed. And this oftentimes gets overlooked. And I was, it was pointed out if you were in my talk earlier, I did not explain what to the glass monitor means. This comes now. I'm sorry about that. I talk about this. So, response times are very, very important when measuring something. Because if your site is slow, your users probably will leave it. Um, like, I'm getting annoyed if I have to wait for two seconds for one web page, and if I'm getting annoyed by the others will too. And then there are actually lots of studies being done where web companies like Google or Amazon or uh, Yahoo artificially increase the load times for a certain user group by like 200 milliseconds, and they actually could measure that, for example, for Amazon, they, uh, the user spent less money on the page or whatever less. So caring about response times is really important. So you should measure it. The easiest approach to measure response times and load times for users is saying, OK, I have my access log. Hey, cool, there is a response time from the server already in there. Here, 882 milliseconds for this uh, request in here. So I already have this log stash there that uh, passes this all out and everything. So I can just take this, graph this, measure this, and, and I'm fine. And then I know my response time. I can get a bit more sophisticated, not doing it overall for all my requests. Maybe I'm distributing it by pages, by URLs, or then also maybe by countries to see if I'm slower in China than I'm in uh, Poland, for example. Very fine. And this is actually a good step and gives you a very nice indicators about what parts of your application are slow or what are fast and what you can improve. But is this actually the stuff we want to measure? It's 882 milliseconds. It's only a part of what we want to measure because for the user, it's not only what happens on the server and how long it took, but also everything else. The user has to do a DNS resolving to your host on it. Has made, the user has probably slow browsers. It has to fetch external resources like JavaScript, CSS, and everything. It has to fetch images, do SSL handshakes, render all that stuff, interpret the DOM, and pass the JavaScript, execute the JavaScript. And some time later, probably much later than the 882 milliseconds, he has actually a page that you can view and display. And this is called to the glass monitoring. We actually should monitor and measure how long it takes for the user to click something until the response and the web page page is at the glass of the monitor of the user. Nowadays it's mostly not glass, but like some kind of plastic. Um, but it comes the term comes to actually from like when we had still had the, uh, the big screens, my screens. So that's what we want to measure. <coughs> A nice tool helping us with that is, for example, Walking Around the Boomerang that does all that. Because in um, JavaScript, there are already, in, for most browsers, APIs in there where you can measure everything from the first click until like everything finished. If the browser, Internet Explorer, does not support it, uh, then <laughs> there are like ways around that which this library gives you. The way it works is, I have in my browser in here, I have running the smaller JavaScript library that basically takes the data from the API for most users. So, and then I get data points for when the user click on the link that go, uh, that went to the page that I'm seeing now, when the user actually finished all the redirects that happened in between because hey, my application is cool doing like five redirects until the page is being loaded. Um, it also measures, measures something like the DNS lookup, SSL handshake, then what the, the time the actual request took, 
plus loading of all the assets, plus executing them until the DOM is fully loaded. And then you have all these measure points, and then you can just send them in a small checking request to some tracking server. Just as part of the URL as query parameters, for example. So that means they will automatically appear in the access log of the server. The server does nothing else, it just sends back a 200 OK. And then can I have the same thing as earlier with our log messages. I can have a log session instance telling on top of the access log, looking at all the tracking <coughs> requests coming in, passing out all my measurements, and then in log session, I have also an output to sets D, just send them to sets D, which sends them to graphite, and I have nice graphs with how long it took to render, how long it took to request, how long the SSL in shape, so I can measure everything up until the glass of the user. And then, if you do this and introduce this, this probably takes like two days of work or three days of work to set up if you already have like, okay, basically, if you already have graphite set up in sets D, so it's very easy to do. Um, if you introduce it, first you will cry because you notice that you're actually very, very slow and then you can improve on that. And what's really fun is seeing, okay, if you really work on it, you improve it, you see all these graphs going down, getting better. Uh, at the same time, you see conversion graphs getting up, getting better, and this is a very, very fulfilling and nice feeling to do, and it's also something I wish all of you can experience in the future when you monitor and log everything on the application. Thank you very much. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yes. Hi, I have a question about outsourcing uh, logs. Like, you really get stuff like this? What do you think about um, so, so it's perfectly fine. If it works for you, great. If you want to pay for it, great. If you have your business is paying for it, great. It's just important that you do it. And uh, disadvantages is um, you're relying on, a, on an external service and you don't have the data in complete control anymore. The nice thing having the data in databases that you own is that you can also just because, for example, with logs to Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch you can query without log stash, you can integrate in other sources, aggregate with other sources, and do analysis on that very easily. With uh, other hosted services like, uh, what was it, what you have, log normal or new relic. You are tied to the APIs they offer. But both is fine. The most important thing is having the central <laughs> Yes, over there. I have a question. I know this was like the Sky or graphic or whatever. Does it have some kind of alerting or notification? Okay, the question was about alerting. Um, Sky has the learning built in for everything else, like Graphite, Elasticsearch. An easy way is you're probably using Dargios already or something like that for operations <laughs> metrics. So, what you can do, for example, for Graphite, you can have a Dargios check. There are already lots of there are already stuff already built. Create a Dargios check um, on a Graphite metric, for example. Or create a Dargios check on an Elasticsearch. It's already all there, and then you can use the reporting that you already have. Yes. Okay, over there was also a question. First, the screen. Okay. Okay, do it like this. In Rails, you have airbreak or RP. So, sentences all in one. Do you prefer any? About anything like uh, this for PHP? Um, the question was in rate of airbreak. Airbreak or RB? Or RB that already integrates all of that into one service. Is, is, um, is it hosted somewhere? Or is yeah, it hosted? it's hosted. It's, it's based on, uh, on, uh, on some API. Okay, then it would be, for example, New Relic would be something like that, or uh, we can also put metrics, custom metrics in there. and. There are lots of sources out there. I'm not familiar with the uh, race things. Um, 
you can kind of have this and just play if you want, which is perfectly fine as long as it works for you and you have all the metrics you need to decide. Yes. Okay, so how about the. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> So how about the influence on the performance, for example, in high performance addies? Did you measure? Um, uh, the influence on performance was the question. Um, for logging, mm -hmm. um, this is in case mostly of errors anyways, and then the performance hit is just writing to a file for my application, which is okay. Um, I need the messages somewhere. So writing locally to a file, I mean, there's not much that can be much faster than that. Um, for the other things, it's a UDP request to locals, for example, in case of stats D, which is also usually fine. So for us, it doesn't, it's probably like two milliseconds every request, which is performance, which for us is fine. What you couldn't do in PHP, for example, if it's really bothering you, you can offload, offload it to a shutdown, to the shutdown handler. So you just keep everything in memory, and then in the shutdown handler, you push, push everything out. Then, of course, the user doesn't notice it anymore because the request is already finished for the user. Um, of course, you're still, you're still doing it in your FPM, you're consuming a bit more memory because you're keeping it all in request, but then you get a bit faster. Okay, um, okay so finally. Okay, finally. Um, I have a question about the first part of your presentation uh, about logging the PHP errors. Uh, do you know some kind of tool that can? Uh, can you do some kind of correlation of errors, like, uh, to do some kind of summary that that error is the same, uh, like, uh, 2,000 others in, uh, in different states? Um, okay, the question was, um, what is there an analysis to see, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, there is, um, for example, the Fofu profile, which is brand new that does that. Um, I think New Relic does it as well. Others probably as well. But if you want to do it yourself with Elasticsearch, what you can do is just um, take the stack trace and uh, do a hash over the stack trace. That's how we are doing it. So we're taking the stack trace, trace passing out the arguments because they change all the time, and then do a hash over the stack trace. And if the stack trace is the same and the exception type and the exception method, yeah, the exception type is the same, then it's the same exception. And you can aggregate over that together. Um, further questions? Okay, then thank you very much, and uh, I'll be.